Hi, I'm Dr. Raj, and here's another preview for Medicine Morning Report Beyond the Pearls. We have a 66-year-old male comes in for the outpatient evaluation for progressive shortness of breath. Stop right there. Is the age important when we evaluate patients for shortness of breath? Definitely. What comes on my differential? Things like COPD, things like CHF, versus on the younger side of things, maybe we'll think about asthma. If it's gonna be a short duration, maybe acute, maybe infection, maybe pneumonia. Anyways, this has been going on for the past six months. Patient becomes short of breath after walking two blocks and has noted a productive cough during this time. With rest, the shortness of breath improves. He denies shortness of breath while recumbent. That means when he's lying down. Why did we mention that? Well, how about one word, orthopnea. What does that mean? having shortness of breath when you're laying flat. What disease do we see that in? You got it, congestive heart failure. Patient only uses one pillow to sleep at night and denies having any swelling of the lower extremities. Based upon this, they're really irking me not to pick a cardiac etiology for the shortness of breath because I'm not getting any symptoms of heart failure. He describes his sputum to be thick and moderate in consistency. Let's stop right there again. Anytime a vignette's talking excessively about mucus in sputum, multi-layering, copious amounts, what should you think about? Bronchiectasis, we're on the same page. Patient denies any fevers or chills, and in the further review of systems is negative. He does have high blood pressure, which is a huge risk factor for, that's right, congestive heart failure, maybe a little left ventricular hypertrophy, but he takes an ACE inhibitor. Let's stop right there. When someone is on an ACE inhibitor, what would be a respiratory symptom they may complain with? Oh, you guys know everything. Chronic cough. Why? Our good friend, Brady Kynan. He has no other past medical history. Patient had a cholecystectomy in the past, and he has no significant family history. Now let's talk about the social history. Do you know what jumps out at me? Not the alcohol, not the illicit drug use, 60 pack year history of smoking. Now, did something jump high on your differential now? Oh, we're on the same page. What are you thinking about? Say it. That's right, COPD. So on exam, he's a thin man and no distress. Heart sounds are distant. He exhibits an increased anterior, posterior diameter of the chest wall. Maybe kind of describing like a barrel shaped chest. We'll see. And during auscultation, he heard some end expiratory wheezing diffusely. No clubbing was noted, and as mentioned before, there was no lower extremity edema. Ah, time for a step one basic science pearl. Because we think that COPD and obstructive lung disease is high on my differential diagnosis, how are we gonna prove that? We need PFTs. What do those stand for? Pulmonary function tests. And what are they made of? Three main things, what are they? Number one, the lung volumes. And what is always gonna be the pain in the behind lung volume to get? You got it, residual volume. And to get this volume, we need to do techniques such as helium dilution, such as nitrogen washout, and even, as you see on this slide, something known as plasmithmography, otherwise known as the body box. The second thing will be flow. And how do you define flow in physiology? Oh, you got it, volume over time. We're gonna measure flow by using spirometry. And the last thing is measuring something known as the DLCO, diffusion limited carbon monoxide. How are gases going from the alveoli, through the interstitium, and into the capillary itself? So, now that you got the PFTs, you are gonna put your differential in two broad categories. On one side, could it be an obstructive lung disease? That's gonna be based off one PFT parameter. And what is that? The FEV1, FBC ratio, which is gonna be what? Low. How low? Maybe less than 70% are predicted. And there are two classic clinical examples of obstructive lung disease, emphysema or chronic bronchitis. They both make up COPD. The FEV1, FBC ratio will be low in both. But notice that line I put right down the middle of the screen. What's gonna differentiate these two? The DLCO. DLCO tends to be low in emphysema, but maybe on the normal side with chronic bronchitis. Do you know why? Because chronic bronchitis is a proximal disease. In the proximal airways, there's no gas exchange that occurs there, and that's why the DLCO tends to be normal. Let's talk about the other side, restrictive lung disease. What one PFT parameter defines a disease as restrictive? 
That's right, the total lung capacity. And what will that be? Low. And now, there are two main broad categories for restrictive lung disease, intrinsic or extrinsic. What's the classic example of intrinsic lung disease? Ah, pulmonary fibrosis. What about extrinsic? Maybe obesity, maybe kyphoscoliosis, or maybe any of these neuromuscular diseases such as, ah, oh, myasthenia gravis, Eaton Lambert, Guillain Barre, you guys are amazing. And what a coincidence. Do you see that line right between intrinsic and extrinsic? What separates these two? The DLCO. What would the DLCO be in Guillain Barre, an extrinsic lung problem? You got it, normal. And with an intrinsic problem, it's going to be low. So, you know what? I want another basic science pearl. What do you see here? On the obstructive pattern, notice a high TLC. That doesn't define the disease as obstructive. Notice the high residual volume indicative of air trapping. But the main thing is, when you look at the forced expiratory volume in one second, what is it? Low. Look how long it takes for the patient to blast all of their air out all the way to the vital capacity. And that's why COPD is an obstructive disease. Where is the obstruction? On expiration. So, time for a step two, step three clinical pearl. Can you interpret this chest x-ray? When we look at the PA view, you see widening of the rib spaces. You can see that the heart and the aorta may be slightly narrowed. There's probably a lot of scarring in the lung, maybe some bulla in the apical parts of the lung. This would be indicative of, given the right history and physical, emphysema. But you know which is going to be the telltale chest x-ray? The lateral view. And look at it. Increase in the AP diameter. The diaphragms appear flattened. And what does the whole image look like? Yeah, you got it a barrel-shaped chest. So, final diagnosis based on this patient's PFTs, based on the history and physical and that chest x-ray, patient has emphysema. So, a couple key things. When we talk about COPD, remember it's a preventable lung disease, which always makes me sad. No matter what the price is for cigarettes, unfortunately people will smoke. Remember that COPD, contrary to asthma, which is another obstructive lung disease, is not fully reversible. And the take home message is the particles that destroy the lung in COPD are noxious particles versus sensitizing particles that we see in asthmatics that rev up your immune system. And when we talk about the different types of COPD, you can have emphysema, which is damage distal to the terminal bronchiolus, including the alveoli. You could have chronic bronchitis, which is going to be more of an epidemiological diagnosis. People who cough for three consecutive months, for two consecutive years, and unfortunately are smokers. And now there is actually an overlap between asthma and COPD. We call that ACOS, A-C-O-S, the overlap syndrome. So anytime you want to treat a chronic disease, no matter what disease we're talking about, you always want to do things that decrease mortality. And what are those things? Things like smoking sensation, things such as supplemental oxygen. And when you want to stop smoking, how do we do it? It's the hardest thing for my patients. Sometimes behavioral therapy, maybe some nicotine replacement, but some patients need some medications. What are those FDA approved medications? Things like, goes by the brand name, Chantex. This is a medication you could take for around 12 weeks. We titrate up the medication, but of course, be careful in patients with depression. Or what about bupropion, brand name, Wellbutrin, marketed for smoking sensation, we call it Zyban. But what is one of those side effects on the board exams you need to realize when you prescribe bupropion? It lowers the seizure threshold, very good. And when we talk about medications just to make the patient feel better, think about bronchodilators, both long and short acting beta-2 agonists or anticholinergics that work on the M3 receptor. And when we talk about corticosteroids, they come in many different forms. If you're having an acute exacerbation, think about oral, think about IV. But when we think about inhaled corticosteroids, even though we use it in severe COPD, not as pertinent of a role as we see it when we use it for patients with asthma. When we talk about oxygen at night, oh, it definitely reduces mortality if you meet the right criteria, but also be careful of diseases such as sleep apnea that patients can be very, very hypoxic at night. Also, a very hot topic are drugs to reduce COPD exacerbations. Which ones come to mind? 
One is known as Reflumalas. It goes by the brand name Dalares. It's an oral medication to help reduce COPD exacerbations, especially those with chronic bronchitis. And there is some data about azithromycin, but remember the cardiac side effects of azithromycin, it likes to prolong that QT interval. And all patients will benefit from pulmonary rehab. And we do offer some lung volume reduction surgeries. And don't forget, in some patients, a single or double lung transplant. So it's time for me to go beyond the pearls. Let's talk about mortality one more time. We said smoking sensation. We said supplemental oxygen in those who qualify. But did you know lung transplant actually finally has been shown to actually improve survival? And when we talk about the acute COPD exacerbation, is there anything that actually can improve survival, decrease mortality? Yes. The role of non-invasive positive airway pressure. And let me say the words. BiPAP, by level. Why is because when you're very short of breath, if you put someone with emphysema on the ventilator, the trick is not putting them on the ventilator, but getting them off. It's very hard. And by using positive airway pressure, it relieves the work of breathing. But of course, when you use BiPAP, which is non-invasive, there are certain people you may not want to use it on. For example, people with mental status changes. But consider that in your patients. I'm Dr. Raj. I hope you enjoyed going Beyond the Pearl.